good morning. <clears throat> if you have a cell phone, <clears throat> if you would at this time, please disable the ringtone. I'll do that with my phone as well. After all the ball games, I at least have a little bit of a voice. Before we begin, Robert White is going to lead us in the word of prayer. Robert. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and for the many blessings of life that has so richly bestowed upon us. The opportunity we have this morning to assemble and study another portion of our divine and holy will. Heavenly Father, we pray that our worship today will be in accordance to thy will and acceptable in thy sight. Heavenly Father, we Ask the blessings upon the congregation here and each and every member that makes up uh, the congregation, those that are sick and unable to be with us, we ask our blessings to be continued upon them. May the things being done to those just be those things that will bring them back to much wanted health and place in life. Forgive us what we feel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, we read, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same things, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, we see that Paul by his pen of inspiration, is trying to show the importance to this church at Corinth, which we will maybe allude to in the sermon this morning, and stress the importance of having the same mind and the same judgment, speaking the same things. Now, the only way that we can speak the same things is if we obey the same book if we abide and we read the same book, which is the Bible. Now the question is this, can we see the Bible alike? That's a very important question, isn't it? Can we see the Bible alike? You know, in the book of John chapter 8, verses 31 and and following, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Very important wording there from our Lord. Ye shall know. Ye shall know the truth. Truth, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, when Jesus is praying to the Father. Thy word is truth. When we think about this, can we understand the Bible alike? Well, we can know the Bible, and we can know what truth is. As we think about this, some say, no. There's absolutely, positively no way that we can see the Bible alike. What's the excuse for all of these different kinds of religions that we that we see around us. You know, you don't have to drive very far either way to see different buildings with names on the outside. And somebody says, see, you you can't understand. There's no way we can understand the Bible alike. But what they do, they seem to overlook error. And so they just make up one excuse after another, and they don't even try. Now, we'll get to those in just a little while. But I want us to realize something. The Bible is the revelation of God. We, we can agree on that, can't we? Somebody says, well, we can't understand the Bible alike, but those that, that say that, some of them, at least some of them, even admit, well, I believe that the Bible is the revelation of God. Is it? Yes, it is. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time 
by the will of men or man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Well, we see this, do we not, in John 14, 26, and John 16, and verse 13. There in John 16, 13, Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall speak, that shall He hear, and He will show you things to come. When we look at this, God's Word is not from men. It's from God. And God inspired certain men to write certain things down. The Bible is the revelation of God. You think about 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 34. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, now listen very carefully to what Paul says, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Somebody says, I have a problem with some of the things that Paul was saying. And I've actually had someone tell me that before. Here's what they did. They came into the church building and they said, I have a problem with Paul. I said, you do? He said, yes. I said, what's your problem with Paul? He said, he had a problem with women. I said, Paul did? He said, yes, Paul did. I said, can you show me where? And he tried. And he even tried in in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But I said, you didn't go far enough in the 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Because you see, if you go just a little bit further down, what you're going to take note is something very important that Paul says. Uh, And I asked him, I said, are you a spiritual person? He said, yes, I'm a spiritual. Are you deeply religious? Yes. You better acknowledge something. You had better acknowledge that what Paul said and what Paul wrote were the commandments of who? God. When somebody says, I have a problem with Paul, it's kind of like, and we'll get to this a little bit later, 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we'll get to that this morning, okay, in our our worship service, in in the sermon. But when you look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, they wanted a king. God said, they don't have a problem with you, Samuel. Who did they have a problem with? God. You see, when we open God's Word and we try to study with people and someone has a problem, their problem is not with you. Their problem is not with me. Deep down inside, their problem is really with the Word of God. And in essence, it is really with God then, right? So as we look, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So revelation is from God. So we see that it's inspired. We see that even the things that Paul wrote are the commandments of the Lord. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul, in writing to a young man by the name of Timothy, and by the way, what occupation did Timothy have? What was he? Starts with a P. R. E. A. He was a preacher. So here's an older preacher, an apostle, writing a younger preacher. Here's what he said All Scripture. Did he say some Scripture? Oh. He, you know, but some people treat it as though that it were not all. Even one very famous televangelist years ago, he said, I'm not a legalist in that I I believe that every jot and tittle is inspired of God. This man had a mass of people that would follow him. And he was very famous and very popular in the 50s and 60s and 70s and even early 80s. He would go to football fields and there would be thousands upon thousands of people that that were listening to him. And here he is saying, I'm not a legalist in that I believe that every jot and tittle is inspired of God. So this man says that not all of the Bible is inspired. But what does the inspired word say? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, I don't like what Paul says. I have a problem with Paul. You better think again and you better acknowledge that the things that he was writing 
were the commandments of the Lord. Somebody says, well, you know, I, I just don't like that. Well, you know, you have a problem with God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? Teaching. 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 All Scripture is given by inspiration. Is God breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof. What is reproof? Okay. When you look at Acts chapter 2, 37, Acts chapter 5, about verse 34, and Acts chapter 7, about verse 54, every one of those times it says the word that was being preached at that time when they heard it, they were pricked in their heart. They were cut to the heart. When you look at Acts chapter, or excuse me, uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, where the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It reproves us. It tells us where we're what? Wrong, right? It's like looking into the mirror of the soul. And when you read and you can readily know whether you're living in the light or out of the light, there has to be something done if you're outside, right? That's where the correction comes in. The Bible is inspired. All Scripture is inspired. And is profitable for teaching, for reproving man, for correction, and then for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be what? Perfect. What is the word? Does that word perfect there mean sinless? Perfectly, no, complete. complete. That the man of God may be complete. Are we going to fail sometimes? Are we going to, absolutely. There are going to be times that we stray. There are going to be some times maybe that, that we even say some things or do some things that are contrary to God's will. But as long as we strive to walk in the light, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and we seek forgiveness of his sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins. You look at James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's completeness. Understanding and realizing that, okay, I have sinned, and when we know that we've sinned, what do we do? Ask God to forgive us. We make it right with the God of heaven. That's correction, instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. That's completeness right there. We understand. Complete, truly furnished unto all good works. There's no other book. No other book on the face of this earth that can do what God's Word can do. James chapter 1 verse 25 what does it do? It saves us. It saves us. The perfect law of what? Liberty. No other book can do that. I remember one book that uh, when, when Lynn and I, when we bought our house over in Anniston, I went under the house, found some things that I wouldn't expect, and some things I didn't know what it was. They were, they were in boxes. But there was a box under the house filled with different objects, different things. And one of those things is called a Reader's Digest. My grandmother used to get them. My mom and dad used to get them. Just, just uh, not even as big as this tablet, smaller. Oh, they would get them and I would get them and I would read the stories. I, mom would have them earmarked. My grandmother would have them earmarked. And I like to read the jokes in them. And, and I like but... Can the Reader's Digest save you? No. It, you know, there were other books my grandmother used to get. One is called Reminisce Magazine. And she would go through that magazine and she would look for a needle and she would circle those needles in that and, and she would read those articles in that. Can Reminisce save you? Not saying that it's wrong to read these things, but what I'm saying is showing you the importance these books, and there's no other book that is inspired. But all Scripture is inspired. Now, as we think about 
Revelation, and we look in God's Word, we see how Revelation comes about. God has spoken to men, or by men. Who, who were the men that God spoke by? You remember from the book of Hebrews, the prophets, right? By prophets, to men, for men. Now, when we think about the revelation of God today, God has spoken by inspiration to the writers of the New Testament, to men, for men. It's there for our benefit. It's there for our doctrine, for our reproof, for our correction, for our instruction in righteousness, that we may be complete, truly furnished unto every good work. But somebody says, well, we can't understand the Bible alike because it is translated inaccurately. Well, that might be the case, you know, in, in some translations. But when we look how the Bible was passed down, Denny Petrillo um, has a wonderful series of lessons on how we got the Bible. The Old Testament written in what language? Hebrew. Okay, the New Testament written in, in what language? Greek. Greek. We also have Aramaic. We also have the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Can anybody tell me what that's called? Septuagint, right? Uh, you might have LXX, but it's Septuagint. When we think about that, we come on down to today and, and we say, well, I like to read from the King James Version. Right? I, I like the American Standard Version. Well, I, I tell you what, I'm, I'm really a big fan of the New King James Version. There are very good translations. Some that, they, they still may have some of man's little tweaks in it, but overall they're very sound. King James Version uses the word baptize. You're literally looking at the Greek word baptizo. But then there are other versions that say immerse. That's what it literally means. Today, have people changed the, the definition of baptism? Yeah. They'll say, well, I'm going to do what? Instead of going down under the water, what do they say? I'm going to sprinkle. I'm going to sprinkle. And then some say, well, you know what? We can't, uh, I'm going to pour. I'm going to pour. This started back in about 251 A.D., where a man that was sick in the bed could not get out of bed, and so they went to him, and they administered what they then began to call clinical baptism. And then it just goes from there. Look where we are today. Somebody says, see, we can't see the Bible alike. We can see the Bible alike. Even in the King James Version, you're looking at the Greek word, baptizo. It means to immerse, to plunge, to go under. In some Greek writings, it means to, to, to uh, uh, the sinking of a, a, of a ship. And when you sink a ship, or it means a burial. When you go to a graveyard, let me ask you a question. When you go to a graveyard, are there arms and noses and stuff sticking up out of the ground? Not supposed to be. <laughs> okay, not supposed to be. Because they're buried. They're under. We understand what that means. When, the sink, when a ship sinks, does that mean that it's still all the way or part, only part way under? No, it's not sunk. It means that it's under the water. When we think about some versions today, there are some that are very questionable. And I want to warn you about these. The New International Version is one. The Revised Standard Version is another, and today's English version. These have inaccuracies in those. They have doctrinal issues in them that make them very dangerous. And sometimes there are brethren that stand up and when they read from these different versions like this, they're actually reading man's doctrine that was superimposed into that translation. They've changed it. They've twisted it. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 16, they do it to their own destruction. We need to be very careful. But somebody says, yeah, see, we can't understand the Bible alike. There's so many. Well, if you look at the Hebrew and the Greek, namely those two, and you look at very sound and stable versions, there's normally no question at all 
What's the difference in the King James Version and the New King James Version, for instance? Anybody tell me? What about the word thee and thou and art? And you, you see, archaic language is taken out, right? For the most part in the New King James Version. And there are some other differences, but both are very, very good. Now, when we think about the completeness of the Bible, somebody says, well, I don't believe that it is really complete. I believe there could be some new revelation out there for us. And I believe if somebody that, if he's really a, a deep thinker and a, 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 a really strong spiritually minded man, if he wanted to add something, well, we could just add those things. We could add those. And, and, and that, I think he would be inspired. No. When you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, again, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jude 3, um, once for all time, the faith is once for all time delivered unto the saints. When you look at Jude 3, a matter of fact, it's the faith, the faith that was once delivered. In the Greek, it means once for all time. The, word, the words the faith mean the system of faith. The New Testament is what's, what's being spoken of here. It is complete. It is under... Understandable. Somebody says, well, I just don't think I can... Under not only can we not understand it alike, you just can't un understand the Bible. Listen, man, there's 66 books. 66 books. You, you, 39 in the old, 27 in the new. You, you think about all of this that was... How can you look at, from, from Genesis all the way to, to Malachi and then from Matthew to Revelation, how can you say that both are... Because it's not rightly divided when you try to look at the whole thing like that, right? We have to remember to rightly divide the Word of God. Now, as we look at Mark chapter 12 and verse 37, we'll look at it in just a moment. Intelligent men can understand the Bible. The Bible is, is understandable. Once again, you remember what Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall what the truth? That means it's understandable. We can know it. Well, he says, well, you can't, no, you can't understand it like. In Mark 12, 37, David therefore himself called him Lord. And whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Somebody says you have to have um, a, a high degree. You have to be a rocket scientist, really. Uh, you have to be so intelligent so your IQ has to be just out the roof in order for you to really understand the Bible. Is that the case? You have to be intelligent, but intelligent man is someone who can read and understand anything. When you look at this, he says, the common people heard him gladly. Somebody give me an illustration of a common people. Just your every... Huh? Every... Ordinary person, ordinary person on the street, right? It's the common people, not just the high-minded people, not just those that were known to be deep thinkers. No, the common person, me, you, the common people heard him, and when they heard Jesus, they heard him gladly. They understood it. But those that sought knowledge and asked for knowledge, you know what? They really didn't want knowledge. They closed their, their ears to our Lord. When you look at John 7, 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Notice the wording here. He didn't say if some men. He said if any man will do His will. He shall know the doctrine. If we are willing to do the commandments of our Lord, to obey our Lord, we're going to be able to understand. We can read and understand surely what we have to do in order to be saved and what we have to do to stay, to stay saved and go to heaven. When we think about Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what? Okay. We're written for our learning. 
that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Those things that we read about in the Old Testament were written for our learning. Well, if we can't learn, but we can. We can know. We can understand. God is not the author of what? Confusion. But of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God's not going to give us a book and say, read it, study it, obey it, and then be up in heaven laughing, thinking they'll never understand this. I've made it so confusing to them, I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to watch. That's not the God that we serve. That's not the God of heaven. The God of heaven is... He has given us a book that we can understand, that we can understand alike, and we can understand alike and edify one another and help one another get to heaven. Honest man can understand the Bible. John 8, 32, Jesus said once again to know the truth. But let me ask you a question. Is truth the same today as it was 2,000 years ago? Yes. One of my teachers at the Chattanooga School of Preaching years ago, we were talking and he said, Keith, the beautiful thing, the beautiful thing about truth, even after thousands of years, truth never what? Never changes. What it meant then, it means today. It doesn't change. For instance, once again, you think about baptism. It doesn't matter what people try to change about it. But guess what? It means today what it meant 2,000 years ago when it was written down for us. Truth is the same. God expects us to reason. Now, what does reason mean? Okay, you, you read, you reason, you begin to compare maybe your life to what the Bible says. And, and what you have done to what the Bible says to do. And you begin to reason and you begin to think and your thought process begins to, to maybe say, well, have I done this? When I did it, did I do it right? And how do I have to live? Do I really have to live by this? Do I have to change my life to this point? You begin to reason. And one thing about reasoning is, are there consequences to our actions? There are consequences. That's one of the first things oftentimes that children find out. There are consequences to your actions. I remember when I was very little, Mama told me not to touch the stove eye. It was very hot. Guess what Keith did? Well, I had to find out myself, right? Mama told me, and she told me that that if I did something, this would happen. But I did it anyway. I remember she had some tube, it was called full. And, I, and it, was, uh, it was silver, that's all I remember. And she, she put that on my burnt hand. and I mean, it burned it good. And then I was a teenager. And she said, I don't want you to run anymore across the street. Well, guess what Keith did? I ran across the street, broke my arm. I, would, I ended up listening to my mama <laughs> after a while. But what about to God? You see, God expects us to reason. And reason through, there are consequences to my actions. You know, one day, I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ. I'm going to stand before Jesus. He, he's the one that, that was rich. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he was rich. And yet, for our sakes, he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be rich. I'm going to stand before him, the one that we read about in the pages, the one that the Old Testament points to, the one that the New Testament alludes to and goes back to, and we have his biography in four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you know years ago, and this astonished me, they asked teenagers throughout this nation, can you name the four Gospels? The four books that tell the life of Jesus. 
Now listen to this. Now this was back in the 90s. 30% could tell you Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't know what it is today, but that's sad. But we're going to stand before Jesus Christ, the one Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is, is written about, and we have his sermons, we have his sayings, we have his miracles, we show, we show uh, or it shows his compassion and his love towards us, his sacrifice. And then we're going to be standing before the one that says, not my will, but thine be done. But then we're going to be standing at his will. Where are we going to go? Because now he's going to be, or then he's going to be our judge. We better begin to reason. We expect, and he expects us to reason. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Ephesians 3, 4, whereby when you read, ye may what? Don't let anybody tell you we cannot understand the Bible. And don't let anyone tell you we can't understand the Bible alike. Because we can. We must, if 1 Corinthians 1.10 is correct, if we're going to speak the same things and have the same minds and same judgments, we must understand the Bible alike. Whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul says, these things I'm writing unto you, you can understand these things. And that's how faith comes, by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Understand means to comprehend. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there times when we're studying and we're reading God's Word that we come across some very difficult passages? Yes. You know what helps me? And, and I, I, I fought getting a tablet for a long time, but now I'm, I'm glad that I have one because it... Not only is it large print, but it has a Bible app on it to where I can pull up different versions, like the New King James Version that may word something a little differently, or the American Standard Version, which really goes very closely and is closely aligned to the Hebrew and the Greek. But I can parallel those versions, and sometimes when I come across something that seems to be hard from the King James Version, which I, I, that's the version I use, Sometimes it makes it so easy. Just because we may not understand something right then, does that mean we're always going to be unable to understand it? The word study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2.15. Guess what that word study means? Diligence. It means diligence. You come across something that's a little difficult, you roll your sleeves up, and you begin to study, you look what comes before it, you look what comes what? After it. That's called context. You may have to have some help. You may even have to call someone. But maybe you'll be able to understand it before you pillow your head. But Paul says, I've written some things, and you can comprehend those things. You can understand those things. Why do we not see all or why do we not all see the Bible alike? Sometimes it's, it's, it's just plain old ignorance. Now somebody says, well, that's rude. What does the word ignorance mean? Not to know, unlearned, right? Uh, sometimes people don't see the Bible alike because they don't read the what? The Bible. Are people going to agree on religious matters if they don't read the Bible? No, no. We have not studied, it says. We are commanded to study, though, when you look at Second Timothy 2.15. So sometimes it's ignorant. Sometimes, I better hurry up, it's prejudice. Sometimes there's a preconceived idea in somebody's mind. This, you know, I, I know that's where you go, that's what y'all believe, but uh, that's not what mom and dad said. That's not what my grandmother and grandfather have said. That's not what I've been taught since I've been raised up. And you're not going to tell me any different. They have a, a preconceived idea in their mind, the way things ought to be and, and unwilling to change. They have their mind made up before they even look at the evidence. They have man A, man B, and man C. They may all have different 
religious background and they'll say, see, we, we can't, but we can. We can understand the Bible alike. Even these men could have. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. What about foolish reasoning? Foolish reasoning sometimes is a reason why people don't see the Bible alike. And here's their train of thought. Here's what's called a syllogism. If A is right, okay, well, B says A is right. Therefore, C is the conclusion. If there is a disagreement, then no one is right, okay? If there's a, different, a disagreement between two people who say they love God, then nobody's right. There is a disagreement, okay? There's a disagreement. Therefore, no one can be right. Well, who in the world and who in their right mind would say such a thing? Now, let me ask you a question. Could both be wrong? Could one be right? And could one be wrong? But here's the important thing. What is always, or who is always right? God. God is. That must be the standard by which we reason. The standard is God's Word. Both could be wrong. One could be right if he's in alignment with God's Word. If we don't know everything about the Bible, then we don't know anything. Well, that's, that's pretty good reasoning, right? <laughs> if we don't know everything, friends, I don't know everything. There are other preachers that do not know everything. We continue to study. We continue to learn. You continue to study. You continue to learn. But there are some people that reason this. If we don't know everything about the Bible, then we don't know anything. We don't know everything about the Bible. Therefore, we don't know anything. We can't understand the Bible alike. Can we understand the Bible alike? Timothy understood. 2 Timothy 3.15 from the New King James Version. And from a child or from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Timothy, even though he was a child, he knew the Scriptures. He understood the Scriptures. Timothy could do it. Whole books were to be read to the congregations in the in the New Testament. When we look at Colossians 4, 16, now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also to the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Somebody says, well, we can't understand the Bible. We can't understand the, any of the books of the Bible. Then why read it? God commanded it so. The apostles commanded it. It is God up in heaven saying, I want you to read the book that they can't understand. I want you to read a book that they can't understand alike. I want you to read a book that's going to confuse them. No. No, we can't understand. Timothy understood. They were told and commanded to read the epistles in the churches. Paul said that when they read, they would understand. Once again, Ephesians 3, 4. When you read it, you're going to understand it. Yes, we can understand the Bible alike. That is the only way we can understand it. It offers truth on some subjects, on all subjects. Not only can we understand the Bible alike, we must understand the Bible alike. Or someone has misunderstood it. Now, when you think about this, this question and this answer. Think about this. Must we hear the Word of God? The Bible says so, right? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Must we really believe it? Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him, that is God. When we think about repent, eh, do we really have to have that change of mind that results in the way we live our life? Do we, must we really repent? Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you shall all, all likewise perish. Confess. Do we really have to confess Jesus Christ? What if I don't believe in Jesus Christ? 
Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Whosoever confesseth me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny also before my Father which is in heaven. Pretty plain, pretty simple. Do I really have to be baptized? Now there's the question. Do, do I really have to be? Acts 2.38, it's for the remission of sins. Mark 16, 16, it's in order to be saved. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, it washes away our sins. It's what puts us into Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4, where all spiritual blessings are found, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Can we not see this alike? If we're going to, if we're going to, we're going to have to be reading what book? The Bible. That is our standard. May God help us to do what we have to do in order to be saved, in order to, to stay saved, and to remain faithful unto death. Somebody says, well, what if I sin after I do everything that you've said? Can we understand the Bible alike? James 5, 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and hide a multitude or cover a multitude of sins. We think about, repeat, listen, there's a sorcerer by the name of who in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 24. He saw that by the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. given. He said, you know what, I want to buy that. And, and I'll tell you what, if you will, let me see how much I've got here. And no, Peter told him he was sinning. His, his money was going to perish with him. He was told to do what? Pray that God would forgive him. You remember what he told Peter? Pray for me. Pray for me. He had a repentative heart. When, he, when you look at confession, once again, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, we confess our faults and to, to, to God. If we confess our faults to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us. When we look, we have to pray. He told Simon the sorcerer to do what? Can we not understand this alike? You know, I had one fellow one time tell me, he said, you know, once I'm baptized, I, I'm, I'm saved, right? I, I said, yes. He said, well, I believe. And this is honestly what he believed. If he ever sinned again, he had to be baptized again. I said, no. He said, yeah. He said, I have to, every time that I fall short and every time that I sin, I have to, I have to go be baptized again. Friends, we can see the Bible alike. They were nowhere commanded to do such. But they were told to repent and to pray. Can we understand the Bible alike? Yes. May God help us to do so. Thank you for your time. Mm-hmm.
Good morning. Welcome to the Jacksonville Church of Christ. This morning I'll be reading Galatians 1.4. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the presence of evil, according to the will of our God and Father. In our singing by singing, <clears throat> Lord, we come before thee now. Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not us to disdain. For you now, asking you to go into this worship with us, Father. I pray that we all have clear minds and open hearts so that we can learn something of your word, Father, and to 
go out into the world and to live it. We're thankful for this building that we have, that we can come and worship you safely, Father, and we're thankful for all of our preachers and our teachers and our song leaders. I pray that they will continue to serve you faithfully, Father, and to always adhere to your truth. Father, most of all, we're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. Pray for all these things in his name. Amen. Prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. Let's sing When My Love for Christ Grows Me. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see. Is there anyone who needs to, um, did not pick up a, a packet of the Lord's Supper as you were coming in today? If you will, just raise your hand and I'll bring you one. If you have a Bible, Turn to Matthew chapter 27 with me as we collect our thoughts and focus on the crucifixion of Christ. As you're turning over there, think about, only for a moment, some of the most foolish or silly beliefs that some people have in this world. And then really how that it doesn't take a lot of effort to have to refute them. Not a lot of work. In fact, in fact, I would dare say that some of the silliest ideas that are known to man are so silly that the vast majority of the world already discounts them. In other words, they have no substance and Common sense and common knowledge says we don't have to protect, uh, we don't have to uh, be so diligent in trying to eradicate those beliefs or thoughts. It's really the serious beliefs that that people begin to um, have the greatest concerns about. 
the ones that have a founding, the ones that have a good foundation, uh, the ones that, that seem, seem to have truth in them that people will have uh, the most concern about if they disagree with those beliefs. When you look at Matthew chapter 27, I see that with regard to the Christ, Jesus. And it says in verse 62, on the next day which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that, the de how that deceiver, Jesus, said, after three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. This was a pretty serious belief. This was something so concerning to people who were afraid of losing power that they had to set the greatest guard, military command as possible, to have a presence around, around the tomb of Jesus the Christ. We're familiar with this and there's plenty of really good lessons we've heard about that empty tomb and how that is significant to reinforcing our faith in Jesus and knowing that he exists and knowing in the resurrection of Christ. That's not my purpose. But I want us to think about for just a second how that the today the powers in the world and Ephesians chapter 1 kind of references the powers that be in the world. They're college professors. They're high school teachers. They're the directors and producers of Nickelodeon, Disney. They produce movies that our children watch without us in the room. They're influences in all kinds of ways, music and books and literature, the powers that be in the world are guarding the tomb still. They don't want us to have access to Jesus. And they're doing their best. But we can take note of the resurrected Jesus today in the same way that he would be raised from the dead as we would read of it in chapter 28 just as then. The guard couldn't do anything about it. God's power is greater. And today, we've got to keep ourselves focused every first day of the week on the cross of Christ as a reminder of no matter what powers in this world are trying to keep us and our children and our friends and our neighbors away from Jesus, the guard can't keep us away. And certainly, while it does successfully pull people away from Christ in some amount, they can't affect God, and they can't affect God's power. He's the one we serve, and he's the one who raised him. Today, as we reflect on the cross, and our lives, and our condition, and this fellowship we have in Christ, let's remember the one we save, the one we serve, are not the people guarding Jesus and trying to keep us away from him. But the one we serve is the one who raised him from the dead. If you will, let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Father, we're so grateful that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. We're so thankful, Father, that no matter how much a world wants to oppose our Savior, that even that opposition, Father, is even greater testimony of his reality, of his existence, not only on this earth, but his existence in a resurrected form for 40 days appearing to people, even 500 all at once on one occasion, and that his reality continues in heaven today on the right hand of, of you on high and over, seated over the kingdom. Father, we're thankful for life we can have in Jesus' name. We're thankful for this emblem, which is uh, representative of his flesh, uh, that he was willing to give up his, his life physically on this earth for the, for the sake of our spiritual life, now and forever. We pray that we'll take this in a way that pleases you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.
Once again, let's pray. Father, there is no greater contested religion on this earth than Christianity. We know through our modern media, Islam is not a challenge to the powers that be. Modern day Judaism is not a challenge to the powers that be. Buddhism, various other world faiths, Father, they're not tested like Christianity. May every time we're tested and our faith is tested and Christ is tested, remind us that those who persecute Jesus are living proof that he died for us and is raised and is our Savior. As we take of this fruit of the vine, Father, help us to remember the blood that he shed on the cross, having lived a sinless life under the Jewish law, and that we fall short so often, but it's only through him that we can have that salvation. Bless us as we take this. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. The New Testament teaches us that the greatest gift, there's no greater gift than the fact that someone would give his life for another. No greater gift than that. We can't outdo the gift that Jesus is to us by God the Father, John 3, 16. A great gift that we can give is our lives to Jesus. Becoming a Christian is that that first step as a measure of a gift to God. But throughout our lives, we also need to continue to give spiritually. And we also need to give as he's commanded for the sake of the um, influence of the gospel and the expansion of his kingdom. And that is a gift of finance. It's a gift as we, as we've been prospered, we give to give back to God for the furtherance of the gospel and the work of the local church. First Corinthians 16, one and two. Let's give thanks for this additional um, part of our worship today. Father, we're grateful for life, breath, and all things that you give us. We're thankful for jobs that allow us to be able to have an income. We're thankful for the various means by which we can uh, earn or obtain money through gifts and, uh, through gifts and, and uh, retirement and um, salary and so forth. Father, we're grateful for Uh, The fact that we live in a place where we live an abundantly rich life in comparison to the world, let us never take that for granted, but instead return it um, back to you with grateful and thankful hearts for the ways you've blessed us. And and, uh, may we connect that abundant gift uh, of money to an abundant gift of spiritual living. Uh, to you, offering up our lives as spiritual sacrifices unto you. We're thankful, Father, for your your blessings, and we pray that you will accept our gift back today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. What a lesson this morning. Let's sing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. If you will at this time, please stand. (coughs) 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Maybe see it. You go to the mall and you sit in the courtyard and you think maybe I will sit down for a little while and just outside the, the mall here and I'll, I'll get a cup of coffee, I'll, I'll read my Bible. It, it's too busy inside the mall. Maybe you're on campus and you're thinking I would rather do my Bible reading outside this morning on campus and, and then you begin to hear people talking on the phone. You see people walking by and and you can't help but notice because when they talk, it's not really a private conversation. You hear them talking about things. It may be that you hear them talking about some things that they're going to do. And, and maybe you realize and you know that the things that they're going to do is contrary to God's will. And, and it tugs at you. And you, and, you, and you think within yourself, man, that, that's horrible. Maybe I should say something. Maybe I shouldn't. Should I engage in conversation, try to help this person? Absolutely, that would be great. But you take note of some immodesty. And it's almost like that, you know, the shorter the skirts or the shorter the shorts, the, the better. And you take note of some of the language that is said, cussing and, and dirty jokes that guys are telling one another as they go by. And it's very hard even outside for you to concentrate on God's Word because you see the world's influence in your school peers. You see the, word, the world's influence on people that are walking by that maybe you may even be an acquaintance with and they stop to talk and then they go on and, and you see how they're living their life and it tugs at you. But there is a tremendous tug considering worldliness, even among God's people today. And we're going to note some things concerning the tug that the world has on us. Now, Kay did an outstanding job on the Lord's Supper. Preparing our minds and, and showing that there are those in the world that are still safeguarding the tomb so that we can't get, spiritually speaking, to Jesus. I love that illustration. That's what this present evil world is trying to hide from us and keep us from, is remaining faithful. Now, as we think about the tug of worldliness, number one, we're going to take note of the problem. Number two, the portent. The portent literally means a warning of calamity. There is a warning there. And then we're going to notice the parable. And then lastly, we're going to take note of the peril. So the problem, the portent, the parable, and the peril. Now let's look at the problem. Now as we take note of worldliness, I would like to, to read to you something that Brother Roy Deaver wrote many years ago. Listen to, to what he says here. The world 
the world has crept into the church at Corinth. Proper, proper efforts to keep the church pure had not been made. Broad-mindedness led to the toleration of wickedness. It was bad, and bad indeed. It was bad when, when Sodom, when Lot moved his house into Sodom. Now take, take note of what he says. It was bad when Lot moved his house into Sodom. It was worse when Sodom moved into his house. It is a good thing for a boat to be in the water most times, right? But it's a bad thing for the water to be in the boat. It was good for the church to be at Corinth. But it was bad. It was bad for Corinth to be in the church. God in former days had a temple for his people. Now he has a people for his temple. Now we may see that God will help us not to be fashioned according to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. There's a problem. Now think about what he's saying. He said, listen, when you think about Lot, it was bad. It was bad indeed. And he couldn't see what was going to happen. He couldn't foresee the calamity that was going to come upon him because of the sin of that city. Remember, he was one that we read about in the pages of the New Testament that he was vexed in his soul when he saw and he heard the things that were going on there. So here he is now. He's made his decision. I am going to look at both, and I'm, you know what? I'm going to take Sodom. It was bad when he moved into Sodom, but it was worse when Sodom moved into his house. It's good that the church was at Corinth. The Corinth needed a shining light, but it was bad when Corinth came into the church. You'll see that at the end of the lesson. As we think about the problem, there is a problem of worldliness even among God's people today. And this is nothing new. There was a problem of worldly-minded people and worldliness even among God's people in the pages of the Old Testament. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8 beginning with verse 1, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre. Now the word lucre there in the King James, here's what it means, unjust gain or profit. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after unjust gain and took bribes and took bribes and perverted judgment. What had happened among God's people? Here were judges. God set up this, this system with judges. And so here is Samuel. He made his sons judges over Israel. And what had happened? The world had gotten in to God's people. The worldliness that was in these two men, everyone saw. Now somebody says, well, what did they do? Surely they had some kind of, of, of uh, an idea how to, how to stop this and, and how to get rid of it. Surely. When you keep reading, I want you to take note just how worse things got. Here's God's people. Here are the elders of God's people in verse 5, or verse 4 rather. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and went to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, You know, you're old. Behold, thou art old. And thy sons have not walked in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Uh, this was God's system. There was already worldliness among God's people, but God's people, those that were elders, they said, you know what, here's, here's what we're going to do. Here, here's what I think is going to help out. If we put a king over us. Like all of the other nations, all the other nations are worldly minded. All the other nations are not God's people. They were God's people, but yet they sought to be like the world. And I want you to take note of what God said and how God responded. In verse 
6, But the thing displeased Samuel when they, when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Look at verse 7, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them according to all the works that they have done since the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt or out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods. So do they or so they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, but show them the manner of the king that they shall have reign over them. When we take note of this, God says, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. This people, they've been this way since I brought them out of the land of Egypt. When they, when they sought other gods and they made unto them other gods, they have been worldly minded. So here they are. They see that, that these two sons of Samuel, these two sons, man, they're worldly. Listen, they're going after unjust gain. They're taking bribes. They're supposed to be judges. They're taking bribes and they're perverting judgment. Listen, if I give you a little bit of money... I need the judgment to go like this. I, I need my guilty to be innocent. I need that innocent to be proclaimed guilty. Perverted judgment. Worldliness. So what was their recommendation? We want to be like the other nation. Moral worldliness. God wasn't happy with that. God wasn't happy with that at all. There was a problem even among God's people in the Old Testament concerning worldliness. This is just one example. But I want you to take note not only of the problem, but of the portent. There is a warning for you and for me in this. If you look in the book of Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 5, Jesus begins there telling a parable. Not the same parable as we'll look at in just a moment. It is a different parable. It is a parable of a sower. In Luke chapter 8, verse 5, a sower went out to sow his seed, and some fell by the wayside and was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Verse 6, and some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprang up, it withered, withered away because it lacked moisture. Verse 7, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell among or on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. You look at verse 11 of Luke chapter 8, you see what the description of all this means. What, what are all of these soils? What, what is this seed? Now the parable, parable is this, the seed is the word of God. God. It's okay. What does the word so mean to broadcast? Now let that sink in. Literally, the Greek word means to broadcast. You have a sower, someone who's broadcasting. If the seed is the word of God, you have someone that is sharing the word of God with others. He's talking about different kinds of souls, different kinds of hearts. And if you were to look down at verse 14, you see that which fell among thorns. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Here is worldly mindedness. When we see the poor ten, he's saying these are like those that the seed fell on among the thorns. Can't be like that. Why? There are so many brethren that allow the riches and the pleasures of this life to overtake them. And yet when we look how clear it is in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, somebody says, well, you can't lose your salvation. Brethren, we can. Take note of this worldly-minded person that is talked about and spoken of in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, they have again entangled therein, or entangled themselves therein, and are overcome. Now how did they escape the pollutions of the world? Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
But yet even though they were saved, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. That is worldly mindedness. Isn't it sad indeed when there are people who obey the gospel? They learn what they have to do in order to be right with God. They repent of their sins. They turn from their sins and they live a godly life for a while and then the world creeps back in. Isn't it sad indeed when the world creeps in the home? Somebody says, how are we going to keep the, the world out of the church? Here's how. We keep the world out of individuals and we keep the world out of our homes. So goes the person so goes the home. So goes mom and dad, so goes the home. So goes the home, so goes the church. So goes the church. This becomes a part of the world. Isn't it sad when the world creeps in the church? Think about James chapter 1 and verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We are to be those who strive to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Why? What's the big deal, Keith? Can we not split the fence? Can we not be lukewarm? Can we not live a little? And Can we not go Friday night and Saturday night and serve the Lord on Sunday morning? Can we not live a life of both? God says no. We're to keep ourselves unspotted from the world outside. When we look at James chapter 4, verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world, now here we go, the friendship of the world is enmity with God, and whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, therefore that person, friend of the world, is the enemy of God. If we're going to be those that, that go hand in hand with the world, we've got a problem with God. And God has a problem with us. There was a parent that I read an article about. cannot remember uh, who the person was that wrote the article, but the parent wrote the article and said that their child had come home on break and said, I have a friend I would like for you to meet. Met the friend. The friend was living in the world, was, was homosexual. And, and here's what they said after they left. The, and I know where your mind's going. The child was a homosexual. Here's what they said. They've invited me to be a part of their wedding. Is that okay with you? Do I have your blessings? If we're going to be a friend of the world... Guess what? We're going to be an enemy to God. We cannot have part and fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We must teach our children. Yes, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. We're not part of the world. As a matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, John, by inspiration, says this, Love not the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but are of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There is a warning, a portent there. What, what is the warning? If we're going to be a friend of the world, we're going to be an enemy of God. We're not to love the world because if we love the world, the love of God is not in us. And this world passes away. And the lust thereof. But if we do the will of God, we're going to abide forever. There is a portent, there is a warning there against worldliness. Now, next point. The parable. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, beginning with about, ver well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go back to verse 13. 
and instead of looking at the parable first, I want to see, I want you to see what comes before the parable. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So here's a person of the company that was there, and he goes to Jesus and he says, Hey, you need to talk to my brother. Okay? We have an inheritance. You need to talk to my brother that the inheritance is going to be shared, it's going to be divided, it's going to be divided right. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Did Jesus come to make sure that people got the money that they were told or they thought that they ought to get? The inheritance that they ought to get, whether it be land or stock or, or what? No. And he said unto, unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Here's a man that says, hey, this, this is supposed to be my, I want this. Covetousness is something that is known all, when you look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, as idolatry. Can we literally have an idol? Do you covet after something? Do you covet after riches? Do you covet after um, anything that you can possess, like possessions? Do you covet after these things? The more, the more I have, the more I, I seem to want. And that's normally the way it happens. Listen, if you will, to the parable. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my goods? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger or greater. And there will I put all my fruits and goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Now, before we get into what God said, notice very clearly, notice very clearly the attitude of this man. Man, look at everything that I've got. Look at all the possessions that I own. Look at what my ground has brought forth. I don't have room for everything that I have. Now, here's something to remember. Are there those living in the world that have need? Absolutely. One day, Matthew 25, 34 and following, we're going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of our benevolent attitude and our love for others. But here's a man that said, look at everything that I've got. I don't have room for it all. Oh, what am I going to do? Am I going to help the needy? Am I going to feed the poor? Am I going to help the downtrodden? No, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull down the barns that I have, and I'm going to build greater. And then I will have room for all of my fruits and my goods. And then, you know what? I'm going to take it easy the rest of my life. I'm going to eat, I'm going to drink, and I'm going to be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool. When God calls somebody a fool, brethren and friends, that man is a fool. Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be? So it is with him that is rich or he that is rich toward himself and not toward God. God said, you're going to die tonight. You think you're going to Take it easy the rest of your life. No, your soul is going to be required of thee tonight. Then everything that you've got is going to be passed down. You know, I have been to several estate sales. I didn't really know when I was a teenager what an estate sale was. I would see it in the paper, the estate sale. I would see signs on the road, estate sale. And, and so I, I decided I love to go to yard sales and flea market. I, I decided one day, one Saturday morning, there's an estate sale. I'm going to go. I want to see what an estate sale is. You know, I, I know what real estate is, so I had a, it must be, belong to somebody. These things, this must be something. It was possessions. What I went in and, and found astonished me. Pictures. Pictures for sale. Family pictures. Family heirlooms for sale. Bibles for sale. Everything was for sale. The children didn't want any of it. 
Didn't want any of it. You see, the thing about it is, one day, everything that you have, when you pass from this life to the next, is going to go to someone else. Someone else is going to... And if you live until the earth is destroyed by the Lord, Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, it's all going to be burned up. Why have the attitude, I'm going to pull down my barns and build greater? Why have the attitude, I'm not happy? I, I'm going to continue to get and get and get and never give? You know, what's astonishing about the Dead Sea, if you take note of the Dead Sea, you have Mount Hermon, which is just northeast of the Sea of Galilee. The snow melts on Mount Hermon. It trickles down, that water does, into Lake Hula. Then it trickles down from Lake Hula to the Sea of Galilee, a pear-shaped body of water that you're very, very familiar with probably, especially if you're in the Wednesday night class going through the book of Matthew. But from the Sea of Galilee going down to the Dead Sea, there is the Jordan River, but then it hits the Dead Sea. Now think about where the water begins, and, and there are several rivers that, that run in to some of these other bodies of water. But when it gets to the Dead Sea, guess what? The Dead Sea never gives. The Dead Sea only takes. So many people are so worldly-minded that they don't give. They don't give to God. They don't give to their family members that are in need. They don't give to their friends. They don't give to their fellow man. They don't give to the poor. They don't give to the hungry. But they take. And they take. They think they're alive. And they think that they're going to be able to live out the rest of their life and take it easy and eat, drink, and be merry. But they're dead spiritually. When we think about this parable... It teaches us about the dangers of being worldly minded concerning riches. You know, if you look at, at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, is what the King James, the um, New King James, or it's either the New King James or the American Standard that says it's the root of all kinds of evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There's danger ahead. If you're going to be worldly minded and you're going to be that type of individual that thinks about gain, 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 what can I get, what can I get, and only about yourself, worldly minded, and, and you think about these riches, guess what? You've pierced yourselves through. You mean a person can actually lose their soul? Let me ask you a question. Do you remember Judas? Judas was one of the twelve that the father gave to the son. You remember that there was a time when there was a lady that brought an alabaster box full of ointment and she broke that and, and there was one there that complained and he said this could have been sold and the money given to the poor and he didn't say that because he cared for the poor. He said that because he was a thief and he had charge over the treasury of the Lord. He had the love of money. Here's a man that was with the Lord day in and day out. And because worldly, mindedness, worldly mindedness crept in, he became lost. In the book of Matthew 6, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through. And still, what's interesting about this passage today, we would say, break in. But when this was written... The houses were made out of clay and Jesus, and they would have one door, sometimes a window, but the rest of it would be clay brick and mud brick. And when thieves broke in someone's house, they didn't break in. They literally broke through the house. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and still, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then we look at verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, Chaldean word means riches. 
We can't serve two masters. We can't serve riches. We can't be worldly minded in one hand and be godly in the other. They don't go hand in hand. If we're going to be a friend of the world, we're going to be an enemy of God. And lastly, we see the peril. If you open your Bibles to go right along with this in the book of Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 17. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not uh, kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And here, listen very carefully to what the man said. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Now, what Jesus says next is where the rubber meets the road. You see, worldly mindedness had crept in to this man's life. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Don't think Jesus doesn't know. One thing thou lackest. Go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Now, we read nothing else concerning this man as to whether maybe he came to his senses. I do not know. But we don't read it if he does. What we read is that he went away. He went away grieved. He loved his possessions. And he had more admiration for them than he did the Lord. You know, when we think about Colossians 4, 14, Philemon verse 24... And also, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, a man by the name of Demas is mentioned. In Colossians 4, 14 and Philemon verse 24, he's mentioned favorably. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, listen very carefully to how Paul describes Demas. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas... The one who was spoken of there with Luke in, in Colossians 4.14 in the Greek. The one that was spoken of in Philemon verse 24 favorably. Now when we come to 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10, this same Demas, he's forsook the Lord. He's forsaken an inspired apostle. And when you do that, you forsake God. For Demas hath forsaken me, and here's the problem having loved this present world. He became worldly minded. Now, I want us to think about some things. As we think about our lives and worldly mindedness, there are some things we need to watch for. I believe this will help. It's, it's the word watch. It's, it's very simple. And it's an acrostic. These are things we need to watch for. Number one, we need to watch our words. If you find yourself being influenced by what you listen to on the radio, by the music you listen to, if you find yourselves influenced by the, by the movies that you watch and the television shows that you watch and maybe the commercials that, that you like and you even get on YouTube and watch them later just to watch the commercial, if you find yourselves being influenced to the point that you say words that you know are contrary, even if they slip out every now and then, you find yourself doing that and maybe telling jokes that you ought not tell and saying things that you ought not say. Remember Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. We're being influenced by the world. We've got to watch our words. We have to watch our words. If you find yourself being influenced and saying things that you know you shouldn't say, worldly mindedness is creeping into your life. Actions. Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But if you find yourself doing things that you ought not do, listen, friends, it happens. People shack up. People say, and I've heard people that grew up in the Lord's church 
And one young man one time told me, he said, I know, Keith, that I'm living with her. I know that I understand that, that you're worried, but listen, I've, we're going to get married. We're going to get married. You don't have to worry about me. I'm, I'm fine. We've already planned to get married. Guess what? They never got married. In the book of, of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed and the file, but whoremongerers, that's fornicators, that's those that are shacking, shacking up whoremongerers and adulterers, God will judge. If we find ourselves beginning to live like the world in our actions, the world has is, is already crept in. We've got to watch our thoughts. Philippians 4 and, and verse 8. Brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are, are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. We must have the right frame of mind. We must think godly thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We must be careful and watch our thoughts. If we're watching movies and listening and thoughts get in our minds and we begin to think things that we know is contrary to God's will. Let me, let me tell you something. A, a funny, it's not really a funny story, but Brother B.J. Clark years ago was preaching. Uh, a sermon, and I'll never forget this illustration. He said, my first work was in Etowah, Tennessee. He said, I would drive home for lunch, and he said, I found that if I drove home for lunch, I could catch a show. You know what the show was? Days of Our Lives. Right? A soap opera. He said, I got hooked on it. He said, I made sure that I was home for lunch the same time every day so I could watch days of our lives. He said, then here we go with, with, with worldliness. worldliness. He, he said, there were people sleeping with people. He said, but then there was a couple and you saw them like two ships passing in the night. He said that the husband and wife were not really spending a whole lot of time together and then here comes another man and, and he's real nice to her at work and, and he, he just really really shows his love for this lady. It's not her husband's fault, he said, but here's the thing about it. I begin to think in my mind, she needs to leave him and go with this other fella. And he thought, what am I thinking? They're married. And he said, it happened that easily that I was already thinking she needs to leave her husband and get with this other guy. He said, it's It's slick. That's how the devil works. We need to watch. We need to watch our conscience. Why? 1 Timothy 4, 2. Our conscience can be seared. Now what does that mean? If we understand and realize what God's Word is and we're trying to live by God's Word and we do fall short, we do something, and we say something contrary, then we do it again. And then we do it again. And it becomes as though it doesn't even affect us anymore at all. The first time we did it, we maybe came forward with tears and repented because we knew, no, we knew that we had brought shame and reproach on the Lord and His church and His people, and we were ashamed of ourselves. But now, you know what? I don't have a problem with it anymore. Better watch our conscience. Make sure it is in alignment with God's Word or heart. Mark 12, 30. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Can worldliness creep in not only into our lives, but the church? I told you we would end with Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. This is the church at Corinth. These are Christians. And Paul says, listen, it is a common thing for it to be reported that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Here's their reaction. Paul says, you're puffed up. You're puffed up. 
and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already. In other words, I've judged on this matter. As though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to separate, to put away that one, and you do it for the saving of his soul. The world had crept in. Has the world crept into your life? We need to watch our words, our actions, our thoughts, our conscience, and our hearts. I would like to end with this. Marshall Clement Curfees, M.C. Curfees, a man that was born in 1856 and died in 1931. He was a, a sound gospel preacher. Now, li li listen to this. This man died in 1931. I don't know when he, when he wrote this. It may have been near the end of his life or while he was in his prime preaching the Word. But here's what he says. He said, It was difficult to tell where the church ended and where the world began. Where the world began. And it was hard to see where the world began and the church in it. You couldn't tell because the world had crept in to the church. I wonder what he would think about the church today. Many congregations, the world has crept in. We don't need it to creep into our lives. It may be that you're here. I want you to remember the passage that was written by the Apostle Paul had read in your hearing by Jacob just a moment ago. Galatians 1.4 Who, speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Jesus died for us so that we could have the forgiveness of, uh, forgiveness of our sins that we might be delivered from this present evil world by the will of God and our Father. Have you been delivered? Have you been saved from your sins? Have you been washed? Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. It may be that you're here this morning and you're in the world. You've been in the world. You've never come out of the world yet. You're not a Christian. Somebody says, well, what do I have to do in order to become a child of God? You just simply do what Jesus says to do. That's, that's simple. Jesus says in John 8, 24 to believe. Jesus says in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, to repent. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, to confess. And then Jesus Christ says to be baptized. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16. It may be that you're here and you already obeyed the gospel many years ago. But you have allowed worldliness to creep into your life. You've allowed worldliness to creep into your home. And you have allowed worldliness to separate you from the God that loves you, the Savior that died for you, and the Holy Ghost that seeks to guide you through the written word. Don't you think it's time that you come forward and come back to God while together we stand and we sing.
Appreciate your attendance this morning. If you're visiting with us, we do appreciate that. And invite you back at every opportunity that you may have. If you are visiting with us, we would love for you to fill out one of the visitor's cards. It's on the pew directly in front of you. And just leave that in the uh, pew, and we'll pick those up at a later time. A few announcements before we're dismissed. Compassion Card Team 2 will meet tonight following services. Uh, Bible Bowl practice today at 4 p.m. in the Student Center. And the college kids remember the JCSC dinner in Devo tomorrow night at 6.30 in the Fellowship Building. Men's Bible class will meet uh, Tuesday at 8 a.m. There will be a birthday cake celebration for the September for the youth and college in the Fellowship Building this Wednesday night. Uh, I follow in the services. The nominational doctrine uh, class will continue Thursday at 6 p.m. in the fellowship building. I extend our sympathy to uh, Franklin and Chris King in the passing of their son, Frank King. Visitation is today at K.L. Brown's funeral home from 2 to 3 p.m. Graveside services will follow at the Jacksonville City Cemetery at 3.30 p.m. The family has requested everyone wear a mask at the funeral home. Also, sympathy to Frances Ship in the passing of her cousin, Gladys Cagle. Announcement on the adopted student. If you are a uh, member here that are signed up to adopt the students, and you have not picked up uh, your uh, adopted student sheets from uh, RJ, please see him and pick those up today. And also, we in need of additional student, uh, additional uh, adopted parents to take on uh, some of the students. Uh, so. Keep that in mind. If you have not signed up, see RJ about that. And we've got plenty of college kids that to go around. If you have not already done so, pick up a bulletin out front. There's many listed in our own. There has been sick in our sick list. Continue to remember them in our prayers. That's all the announcements we have. I wish to ask our Heavenly Father and His Church to forgive me for not being physically and mentally able to attend church. Also, please forgive me for not bringing Brantley to church. Please pray that I can become mentally and physically strong once again. I'm going to ask Daniel Beck in the closing prayer if he will make mention of Sue and, and bring her name before the, the Father's throne during the closing prayer. Will at this time please stand and remain standing for the closing prayer. We'll sing the first verse of the Lily of the Valley. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The Lily of the Valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Will you please bow with me as we approach God in prayer? Heavenly Father, you are glorious beyond measure, and please never let us to forget that. Please help us to focus on the place that you would have us to have in this world and in your kingdom. Please help us to focus on the opportunities we have to grow and to mature, to be more like Jesus, and to be a better influence on this world. Please help us not to let the world influence us and warp us and turn us into something that you don't want us to be. Please help us to focus on the lessons we've learned this morning and this month. And please help us each day to strive 
to be a little bit less like the person that we were, a little bit more like the person that Jesus is. Father, please help us to uh, continue to be in good health so that we can be here to encourage each other and to study from your word. Father, please especially take care of Sue, who has been struggling. Please help her to be able to be here with us and to be upright in your sight. Please be patient and forgiving with all of us as we continue through life struggles. Please especially take care of those we have been praying for for so many weeks who are struggling with these major illnesses and injuries. Uh, Father, we have so many we've been praying for who are struggling with cancer, with COVID, and with all manner of ailments. We know that they want to be here among your people and that it's just been too hard for them. Please help them to be made whole. And please help all of us to be whole in a spiritual sense. Please help us to reflect on the words that we've learned here today, the lessons from your word. And please help us to apply it to our lives so that we can encourage the people around us uh, to do the best that they can to be living in line with your word and your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.